In this uh, discussion, we're going to examine uh, the methodologies for determining the critical value for large and small samples. Of course, this is brought to you by the infamous Dr. Dog. Welcome back to the Dog House. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to just have a brief discussion on how to determine a critical value based on the sample size. You will recall that large sample for our purposes implies a sample having more than 30. Small sample implies a sample having less than 30. Give this your best shot. Good luck. Well, friends, one of the first things that we need to do is to calculate large sample critical values uh, using the z-score. And I'm going to show you how to do that using a t-table, which is really pretty clever. The issue in looking for critical value is very simple is in, in the large sample case. Is the test a two-tailed or one-tailed test? Now, I could go into a diatribe about making you read the z-curves and all of that, but if you can be really clever and use the t-table and make it work, you're going to be very happy. Hope you recognize this. This is the t-table. Now, look across the top. Critical values for students' t-distribution, one-tailed area, two-tailed area, Degrees of freedom, confidence, down at the bottom you have an infinite sign. We're fixing to show you some real neat things about this. The first thing I want you to note that in hypothesis testing, we don't use that third level, that degree of freedom and confidence. We use one-tailed area, two-tailed area. So the first thing you're going to need to know to find this z-score is it a two-tailed or a one-tailed test. Depending on what it is, you've got to go to the right line. The next thing you need to know is how much is your alpha. Now, if you have a confidence level of 95%, then your alpha is 5%. On a one-tailed test, you have 95% in the fail to reject and 5% in the reject. You might have a confidence level of 90%. And on a two-tailed test, 90% in the center means that you have 10%, 5 on each end. So you need to figure out which line you're going to read, one-tailed or two-tailed, and the next thing you do is locate your alpha on that, uh, on that line. Now here's what's really, really, really clever. Notice that bottom line has an infinite sign. What that says is if that sample grows infinitely large, then this thing homes in on the z-scores. Those values down there on the bottom are z-scores. For instance, if we have a one-tail test at 5% error, 5% alpha, then the z-score we're going to use is 1.645. Pretty cool, isn't it? I think you can learn to be clever, and if you can learn to be clever, you can use this and pop your z-scores right out of there for your critical value boundaries. Now we're going to look at small sample critical values and using the t-score in place of the z-score. Right now I have a very quiet little mouse right here beside me because my beloved granddaughter is helping me record this, so it really ought to be good. There are some questions that we ask, of course, just as we would in the z-test. Is this a two-tailed or a one-tailed test? What is the alpha level for the rejection region? How many degrees of freedom do I have? Remember, in a small sample, degrees of freedom is equal to the number in the sample minus 1, or df equals n minus 1. Then, after you've answered these questions, go to the table. You should recognize this beautiful table, and it brings neat, warm things and feelings to your heart. As before, the first thing you need to determine is which row across the top you're going to work with. Are you going to work with a one-tailed area or a two-tailed area? Is this a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test? After you've determined whether it's one-tailed or two-tailed, then what is your alpha level? For instance, an alpha level of a one-tailed test of 0 .05 has been identified. And the last thing that you want to look at is your degrees of freedom. So to rehash this thing, you decided as to whether it was a one-tailed or a two-tailed test. When you decided which line you were going to use, you went around and located your alpha. Then from there, you went down that side and located your degrees of freedom. And at the conjunction of the degrees of freedom and the alpha, then you have the score that you're going to use. For instance, a one-tailed area with an alpha of 5% with 8 degrees of freedom would use the score of 1.860. So you should be ready to go in finding small sample T-scores for critical values.